so we're gonna do bond colorimetry. So we're gonna uh, go to this site by Gary Bertrand at University of Missouri. Uh, the website is web.mst.edu slash, and that's a tilde, gbert slash cal slash cal.html, okay? So uh, this uh, site right here has a simulation of what the bomb colorimetry experiment is going to look like. So let's click on bomb right here. That's better. So this is the procedure for assembling the bomb. So there's a fuse wire. Here's uh, the fuse wire that we have in the lab. Okay. okay. So what you need to do is to assemble the bomb. You take a four inch piece of your fuse wire and then you thread it through your uh, mount right here. And here's your sample cup, sample holder. Put that in your uh, <coughs> assembly, okay? And so what you do, okay. did I start this thing over or? No, uh -huh. yeah, it's quick. It was too quick, okay. So that was the, so you put your pellet in the, in the cup, okay, and then you place the inner part of the bomb in its holder, thread the wire through the electrodes, okay, and then wrap it and then securely around the post. Place the cup with the pellet in the ring. Let's let's redo that. Okay. So how to assemble the bomb? And there's your lid. So four inch fuse wire, and you need a sample. Here's your sample, by the way. Just like a sample. So it's in the pellet form. So you thread the wire through the uh, electrodes and okay. put the cup with the pellet in the ring of the electrode. Bend the wire down okay. so that it's on top of the pellet. You add water and then assemble the bomb. Close it. That's completely sealed. <laughs> so you pressurize your bomb. The way you pressurize your bomb is you hook it up to an oxygen tank, open the main valve. This is the main valve right here, okay? This one right here. This one right here, okay? And this thing is a relief valve right here, this thing, this one over here, so you can use that to release the gas. So what you do is you fill the you fill the, your bomb to 20 atmospheres, okay, and then release. Okay, you have to repeat this four four to six times. And the way the reason you do that is you want to get rid of any nitrogen from your air that was in the air in that bomb to begin with. Okay, so you'll have a, an oxygen-rich atmosphere in here above yeah around your sample. Okay and that's at 20 atmospheres. So that's how you pressurize your bomb. So once that's done, here's what the apparatus looks like, okay? So this is where you put your, okay, so this is the bucket where you put the bomb. So you put the bucket, bucket the bomb in the bucket, okay? And here I have the, what do you call this? Things that I uh, used to lift the bomb. Okay. When you put it in the bucket, you'll notice there's a notch at the bottom. Okay. So you line up your bomb with that notch there. And then, so this handle for the bomb works just like a pastry clamp. Squeeze it to release. Okay. 
So make sure it's secure. So you put your bomb in your bucket. Right? And then, so let's, let's click on proceed here. So put the bomb in the bucket. Not, that's not, not trying to at the bottom. And then what you do next, you put it inside the shell right here, okay? Put the bucket inside the insulated shell, and then just verify that it, the assembly fits. Now the bomb calorimeter we have in the lab is slightly different from this one. Okay, it's already set up, so you just close it. Uh, and then what you have here is you pour two liters of distilled water into your bucket. Place the bucket in the shell again, and then connect the firing wires to the bomb. So what these firing wires do is when you press the button, it sends an electrical spark which triggers the combustion of the pellet inside the bomb. Okay? So, set it up, and then uh, once you're ready to start your reaction, you just hit the, hit, hit the red button, uh, and that will send an electrical spark and cause the reaction to occur. So, when that reaction happens, when you do that reaction, the saw that uh, ignition right there, and what will happen is the temperature is going to rise. Ignite, temperature is going to, going to rise, you monitor the temperature versus time. Okay? And that, in essence, is what you do when in a bomb calorimeter experiment. So let's, let's uh, do this, uh, let's do a simulated run here. So let's choose a sample. Okay. Now in bomb calorimetry, the first thing you need to do is do a standard run, and your standard run uses benzoic acid. Okay, so you burn benzoic acid. If you look at the bottle of benzoic acid that I gave you, you'll see that it has a known delta H. It has a known delta H of combustion. What's the delta H of combustion given? I mean, the heat of combustion, not delta H. Delta U of combustion. Twenty-six point. 453 yes. kilojoule. Yeah, yeah, kilojoule. Yeah. Now, the one that he has up here is 26425. Right. And not only is your, every time you do a run, okay, that wire is also going to burn. Okay? So, what's the, what, how much, how much heat is generated by burning of your wire? Part of your wire is going to burn. So, what you'll need to do after your experiment is you're going to look at the wire and you're going to weigh it. So you're going to weigh your wire before and after. Actually, you can just measure the length of the wire before and after because uh, you'll notice your wire has a value of how much heat it generates per centimeter. So you can measure the length before and after. And so what number do you have for the, for the one we have? 1,400. 1,400. 1,400 calories per gram. Okay, let's see if that matches up with this number here for uh, Iron wire, which is 58, 58 joules per gram. So what should that be? 1,400 calories per gram. What's what's a calorie? One calorie is 4.184 joules. Right. So multiply that by 4.184. So 58, 58 joules per gram. Okay. So that's the amount of heat that is released when your fuse wire is burned inside the bomb. So in a standard run, you would know how much heat is generated. Okay? So what's the purpose of the standard run? The purpose of the standard run is to determine the heat capacity of the calorimeter and its contents. So C is the heat capacity of the calorimeter and its contents. So if you look at your handout right here, I give you a summary of in your data sheet, okay? The heat released by the combustion of the sample plus heat released by the combustion of the wire is equal to negative C delta T, okay? 
So Q here is negative. Okay, it's an exothermic reaction. Okay, uh, delta T is going to be what? Temperature is going to rise, right? So delta T is positive. So in the standardization run, what are we looking for? Right here, the heat capacity of the calorimeter and its contents. Okay, so delta T, you measure that from your experiment. And this is known, heat, heat of reaction due to the combustion of the sample. And Q of Y is the heat of reaction due to combustion of the fuse wire. So in a standard run, standardization run, your goal is to determine the heat capacity of your calorimeter and its content. So what's our formula for C based on this? Okay, so it's negative of Q sample plus Q wire divided by delta T. Right? So we're going to do benzoic acid as our standard sample. So let's do a standard run. And so let's put, let's do the simulation so we can get the mass of our sample. So I'm going to do benzoic acid. I've chosen my sample. Choose the sample. It's benzoic acid. And so now what do I need to do? Take it to the balance. Weigh the sample. And so my sample weighs 0.9521 grams, okay? So let's put that in. Our sample mass is 0.9521 grams. Okay, here 0.9521 grams. What's the known delta U of combustion for the sample? Joules per gram, what is it? We're going to use his number, okay? So, uh, what was the name? Just go ahead, follow, follow along. Okay. So, constants 26,425 joules per gram. Okay. So, 26,425 joules per gram. Now, is this positive or negative? Should be a negative number, right? So that's joules per gram because that's an exothermic reaction. So what's our Q for our sample? If we know the mass of our sample and we know Q joules per gram, how much? what's the Q for our sample? Just multiply the two. So let's multiply. What do you get? Nine five two one times twenty six thousand four hundred twenty five. That's how much? Twenty six thousand four hundred. times twenty six four twenty five. Okay. So it's 25, 159. That should be close to 26,000 since 0 0.9 is almost 1. Right? So 25, negative 25, 159. Negative 25, 159 joules. Now how many sig figs should I have? Only four, right? So this is my last sig fig right here. I'm just going to keep that extra digit there. Okay, so my last sig fig is the 5. What's the mass of the wire that was burned in this experiment? Well, we haven't done the experiment yet. So, oh, we do have the mass of the wire before. It's 0 0.0201 right here. So I'm going to ignite the sample now. And I'm go it's going to record the temperature of the reaction mixture as the after ignition. So ignite the sample, and you'll see the temperature increases. Okay, so you let, actually you do let, you monitor the temperature over like a five minute period before you actually ignite, you give your sample time to equilibrate, okay. So, so you ignite it at the five minute mark and then the temperature goes up. And so how much wire was burned? So after you've done your experiment, you collect the wire. So you had the mass of the wire before and you have the mass of the wire after. How much wire was burned in this particular run? 
0201 minus 0 0.0173. How much was it? You did that in your head? 0 0.0201 ah, minus 0 0.0173. Yeah, that's right. 201 minus 173 is 28. Okay, 0 0.0028 grams. So that's the mass of the wire. So let's see. <coughs> was it again? Point zero zero two eight. Okay, so point zero zero two eight. Okay, what's the known delta U of combustion for the wire? What was it we calculated? Fifty eight fifty eight joules per gram. Okay, yeah, fifty eight fifty eight joules per gram. So this one is fifty-eight uh, fifty-eight fifty-eight joules per gram. Now this should also be negative, okay? Uh oh undo. So now, what's Q for my wire? Multiply the mass by the heat uh, reaction. So 0 0.0028 times 58.58 gives me 16.40. Okay. So this is negative 16.40 joules. All right. Now. So we have our Qs. What do we need? The only thing we need now is delta T. So how do we determine delta T? Okay. Delta T, if we had a perfect calorimeter, okay, the ideal uh, perfect calorimeter, you would have an instantaneous <coughs> change in temperature, and then it will be perfectly insulated. So it would be flat at the beginning, and then it will suddenly rise, and it will be flat at the end, right? And so that would be our delta T. But, of course, we have a realistic simulation here. So in an experiment, it actually takes time for the thermometer to, to catch up with the actual amount, uh, uh, the actual temperature, okay? Now this, uh, so what you do is, you, what you extrapolate the initial times, okay, just before firing, okay? And extrapolate backwards the trend from uh, after you fired your, after you ignited your sample. Okay, and what you need to do, and let me show you how the extrapolation is done. Right here, extrapolate. It does it for you. Okay, so from here, so you find a time here. Okay so that when you do these extrapolations you want this area right here to be equal to this area right here and the way you do that is um and so this is what you would call your mean temperature right here okay so that's the mean temperature of your reaction that's the t of your reaction that's the average temperature of your reaction how do you find that point right there where you have to do your extrapolation to the way you do it is you want to make, if you want this area right here to be the same as this area right here, you want to make, you want to move, keep moving that line so that this length right here, this delta, uh, let's see, let's call this A and let's call that difference right there B, okay? So this thing right here is A. And this thing over here is B. You want the ratio of A to B, okay, to be 63 to 32. Okay? That's actually 1 minus 1 over E over 1 over E. Ah, 63 to 37, I'm sorry. Okay, so what's 1 minus 1 over E over 1 over E? Let's see. 
for us now, can't. C. 1 over E is, is 0.37, okay? And 1 minus 1 over E is 60.2. So if you want 1 minus 1 over E over 1 over E, you want a ratio of 1.718, okay? So what you need to do is, you if you plot your data on Excel, you're going to have to play around with where you're going to be extrapolating the initial and final temperature so that the ratio, okay? So I, when you extrapolate the final temperature to here, okay, let's call that your TF, and you extrapolate your initial temperature to here, that's your TI. Your mean temperature, T, should be such that, so this line must be located on your graph so that this is this mean temperature, your mean temperature minus Ti, that one, that would be what? That's what we called A, right? And our B would be T final minus T mean. Okay, you want that B to A ratio, uh, A to B ratio, A over B, you want that to be 1.718, okay? So he's already done it for you here. It's already done for you here. And so the initial temperature here. Huh? Uh, let me see. Oh, yeah, you can move it. Oh, okay, so you do have to move it, okay, so that you have more or less equal areas in there. Okay? And so what would we have to do? Now, uh, so you want the ratio to be, what was it, 63 to 37, right? 1.718. So our initial temperature, this one is giving you the initial temperature and the final temperature. So this would be, so as you're moving it, your T final is this one right here. And your T initial is this one down here. Okay? So you want to get that mean temperature right there so that this difference over that difference is 60, 63 over 30. It's 1.718, 63 over 37. Okay, so let's just pretend that that's the, the right number. Okay? You have to actually work with it. So let's pretend that that's the correct number. So what's our mean temperature here? Uh, it doesn't, but you can read it off your graph. Okay, but let's just pretend that that's correct. Okay, so let's, what would be our delta T? Actually, let's see. What's our delta T? 26.508 minus 24.317. What was, what was that? 26.508 minus 24.317. That's 2.191. That's our delta T. Okay? 2.191 degrees Celsius or 2.191 Kelvin. What is our uh, mean temperature? Assume, and it doesn't look right, huh? That area is too. If this was correct, what would have our mean temperature been? What would have been our mean temperature? So you're going to say, let's do that on math again. Let's do, what was our T final? Okay. Give me a T final. T final minus T mean, right? Over T mean minus T final. You want us to be equal to? 1.718, right? Okay, what did what did we say our T final was? Okay, so let's solve for T mean. Ah, this is over T initial. No, we want T initial up here, sorry. No, you want this in, uh, on top. You want T mean minus T initial 
over t final minus t mean okay we want that to be equal to 1.718 right I'm just correct okay so t initial t mean and t final so you want t mean minus minus t initial, that's your A, right? Over t final minus t mean, that's your B. You want that to be 1.718. So let's solve for t mean. What should be t mean for this one? Symbolics variable solve. And that would be your answer if those were the correct numbers. So what's our t final? T final, what did we say was t final? 26 point, um, 26.508, okay, 508, and what's RT initial? 24.317, so we can calculate what RT mean is, it's 25.7, so if we had the right numbers, our, my, our mean temperature should be 25.7. Is that about right? Yeah, it looks about right, huh? 25.7. Right there. Okay, and that's where it crosses. That's where that's where it should cross your your rice curve. Okay. So let's just take those numbers as correct and let's put them into our document. So 26.508. It's our final temperature minus, what's our initial temperature? 24.317, and that gives you how much? Okay, positive 2.191. Let's verify. So we have, what was it? 26.508 minus 24.317, 2.191. So what is the heat capacity of our calorimeter? <coughs> Negative of the sum of the two Qs divided by, so it's going to be, okay, so negative of, negative 25159, okay, plus negative 5858, oh, negative 16.4, I'm sorry. So this number and that number, negative 16.40, divided by delta T, which is 2.191. And so what's our heat capacity? Two five one five nine last sixteen point four okay, divided by two point one nine one that's eleven four nine zero okay four sig fix so eleven four nine right zero eleven four nine zero joules per Kelvin okay so that's how you calculate the uh, heat capacity of your calorimeter and its contents. Now, in a bomb calorimeter, you're always going to have, uh, you're, you're going to have very similar products, regardless of what your reaction is, because most of, most of the time you're just going to be using, uh, it's pretty much being used for organic compounds. So what are the products of combustion of an organic compound? Carbon dioxide, water. So the sample is going to have a very, uh, and then the actually the bulk of the heat capacity of the calorimeter comes from what? It's not really your product mixture, it's just a little amount of gas in there. The water that's in there. You get two kilograms of water in there, okay? So pretty much that should be the heat capacity of the water, very close to, what's the heat capacity of our water? Two kilograms, so 2,000 grams 
times 4.18 joules per Kelvin per gram, right? So what's 2,000 times 4.18? Of that 11,800, 8,300, so 8,800 8, comes from water. Okay? So 83.66. So... About 8,400 of that comes from water. What's the rest of it from? The bucket, your the bomb itself, right? And so, um, you can see it's mostly due to water. Now, like I said, when you do your reactions, you're, get, you're going to get very similar products. You're going to be using very similar amounts. So the heat capacity of your product mixture inside your bomb is going to be more or less the same between the standard run and the unknown run. And that's what you want because otherwise if they're not very similar then that you cannot assume that you have the same heat capacity for both the standard and the unknown run. So what do you do with the unknown run? In the unknown run, what was our equation for bomb colorimetry? Okay, for the unknown run you now know what your C is, right? You still measure your delta T. You still know what your QR is. So what can you determine from your unknown run? Q for the sample. Okay, so let's do one for uh, this. So we've done this one. So let's choose another sample. So now you pick an unknown sample. Let's say stearic acid. Take it to the balance. You got your mass. Okay. And then you have your, uh, you ignite your sample. And then you extrapolate. And then you can make your adjustments here to have equal areas. I think by default this goes to the equal areas. So, um, maybe it, can always check okay now you can view your data the actual data that was simulated for this by, by clicking here and you can just copy this to Excel okay so copy it and then paste it in Excel and you can actually graph your data in Excel and verify for yourself that uh, you get the same numbers okay so let's go to the lab and I'll show you the rest of the setup. So let me pause for a All right, so let's recap. How is the, how is our adiabatic calorimeter different from the one that's illustrated here? This shell right here, okay, in our calorimeter, inside where you put this bucket in, you have an external jacket where you can pump what? Hot or cold water. Okay, so what? you can pump water into it. You can run water through it so that as the temperature rises, when, when you ignite your reaction, as the temperature rises, you've got another thermometer out here. And you want to make sure that the thermo So you pump hot water in to make sure that the temperature in the outer jacket always matches the temperature inside in the bucket. So that maintains adiabatic condition. So if you don't have that exterior jacket, you have what's called, uh, what do you call it? An ISO parable. Okay. Whereas the one we have in the lab is an adiabatic calorimeter. Okay. So that should do it. Okay. So let's say we measure the heat of combustion of some compound. Uh, let's see what compound. Uh, let's say let's say sucrose. C12H22O11. Okay. So uh, once you've done your heat, you, once you've measured your delta U for the combustion. Okay, you divide it by the number of moles to get the value per mole, right? So what would be the combustion equation, the chemical equation for the combustion of, of sucrose? C12H22O11. 
O11, right? Solid plus O2. What are the products? Carbon dioxide gas plus liquid water. Okay? And you get the delta U for that, right? Per mole. Uh, let's balance this. What do we need to balance this? You get 12 CO2. And you have 11 H2Os, right? How much O2s do you need? So 12 times 2, that's 24. And 11 times 1 is 11. So that gives you 35. Okay. 11 is over here. So 35 minus 11, that's 24 left. So you need 12 here. Okay. So that's your balance equation. So you'll need that for the compounds assigned to you. Okay. Now, uh, so this is 12 CO2 gas. All right. What's delta N gas for the combustion of one mole of the sample? How many moles of gas do we have on the product side? This is liquid water, so it's 12 moles of gas on the product side. How many moles of gas on the on the reactant side? This is gas. Also 12. Okay, so this one's a nice case where delta N is zero. But if that delta N wasn't zero, then you're gonna have to do a correction to get the delta H. What would be your delta H? Remember delta H? H is U plus PV, right? So what's going? To, what's your delta H going to be? Delta U plus delta PV, and that's just going to be delta U plus delta N gas times RT. Okay. So if that delta N is not zero, then you you're going to have to uh, add a correction term to get the delta H for the combustion for your reaction. So you get your heat of combustion. Now what temperature are going are you going to be using? This temperature that you use for your calculation is the mean temperature. Okay, so if you remember, that's the temperature where you have equal areas in your thermogram before and after. Okay. So that allows you to get the delta H. Now the last thing I next I want you to do when you do your calculation is to calculate the enthalpy of formation of the sample. Enthalpy of formation of your sample. Actually, this is not the standard. That's just the enthalpy of formation of your sample. And then you compare that with the standard enthalpy. So how do you calculate the enthalpy of formation of your sample? If this, if your sample was sucrose, what would it be? Delta H formation of sucrose, right, is equal to what? Mm -hmm. right, products minus reactant, right? So delta H combustion. That's the experimental value that you're using, right? That's for the overall reaction. Is equal to delta H formation of CO2 gas times 12, right? 12 moles. Plus delta H formation of liquid water. Multiply that by 11. Minus it's delta H formation of O2 gas. 0 minus 12 times 0 minus delta H formation of sucrose. Okay, which of these did we determine experimentally? This one, right? CO2, this one you need to look up. Water, you need to look up. So what can we solve for? Delta H formation of sucrose. Okay. So this is how you can build a table of delta H formation of a variety of compounds. You just run a series of these compounds in a bomb calorimeter, get the heat of combustion, and from all of these heats of combustion, as long as you know the delta H formation of CO2 and liquid water, CO2 gas and liquid water, 
you'll be able to get the delta H formation of your sucrose. Okay? So you'll need that for the compounds assigned to you.